Well, Secretary General, thank you so much for this introduction. And now it's, it's over to you guys, uh, because Secretary General, as I said, has accepted uh, a substantial Q&A. Uh, stupid questions do not, do not exist, as you know. Um, who is going to be the first and the courageous first? We go, we go for, we go for uh, ladies first. Please, go ahead. Um, I was just wondering, as, as the world is changing and NATO has to adapt to different things with the climate change and the melting of the ice caps, um, uh, does the Article 5 apply to that situation where all the um, member countries have to, have to like, work together to solve that issue? Or what is your opinion on that? Also, NATO is a, a military alliance, so, so, so NATO doesn't have the tools uh, to address climate change. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, climate change is important for our security, uh, meaning that uh, climate change will uh, most likely lead to uh, that people will start to move. Uh, it, will, uh, it may lead to new conflicts about water, about uh, agriculture, uh, and uh, it may also you know, change, uh, for instance, uh, 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 transport routes, uh, I know that, for instance, uh, many people are now looking into the possibility of starting, you know, uh, regular commercial, uh, also uh, ship uh, uh, sealings, so see lanes of transportation from, for instance, uh, Antwerp or, uh, or Rotterdam uh, uh, to, to Asia, not through the Suez Canal or around Africa, but uh, over the North Pole or the uh, North East Passage. Uh, because the ice is uh, melting. Uh, so uh, climate change has uh, uh, security consequences, and uh, NATO has uh, recognized that in what we call the strategic concept. But to address climate change is about how to reduce emissions, how to uh, develop uh, cleaner uh, forms of energy, how to... Um, how to uh, make sure that we are uh, able to protect the rainforest and, uh, and uh, develop uh, technologies which allow us to drive in cars which are not polluting and so on. It's important that NATO allies engage in that, but it's not for NATO uh, to, in a way, uh, develop windmills or uh, uh, clean energy because we have other institutions and organizations uh, for that. Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. I would like to ask a question, a very specific question, and it's about the tension uh, between Turkey and Greece, at, and Greece at the moment. And I would like to ask you, uh, is it enough for NATO uh, the fact that both countries are members of, the, of, of NATO? Is it enough for NATO in order to, for it to use it as a justification, as a yeah, as a justification for it not to take a clear stance on the issue when a country is breaching international law and is invading uh, many times in, uh, even within a day, is invading airspace and waters of another country member of NATO. Is it, in, is it enough for NATO to use it as an excuse? Thank you very much. NATO is the answer to many problems, but NATO is not the uh, answer to all problems. Uh, uh, meaning that NATO is uh, established. We have structures, we have mechanisms, we have, uh, we have uh, forces which are uh, uh, assigned to and which are uh, tasked to address uh, threats uh, from uh, countries outside and from threats coming from outside the NATO alliance. Uh, I say this also because any decision NATO has to be taken by consensus. So if we were going to do anything, we need uh, not the majority of the Allies to agree, but all of the Allies to agree. And, and the only way we can have that kind of decision-making procedures is, of course, that uh, we know that we will never be able to take a decision which is contradicting the interest of one uh, ally. So, 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 so when NATO was founded, the way we are constructed uh, makes us uh, unable to address uh, disagreements between allies. So uh, I accept that there are differences uh, between Turkey and Greece. I have spoken with the uh, Greek Prime Minister, I've spoken with the, with the Tur Turkish President. I, I'm, I've been briefed uh, uh, many times. Uh, this is about uh, also islands and, and territories and, and airspace in the Aegean uh, Sea. 
uh, and I recognize that this is a challenge, uh, but it's not uh, 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 something that NATO can solve. Uh, it is something that has to be solved in a spirit of cooperation uh, between uh, Greece and Turkey, and I welcome that. Uh, I know that recently the Greek and the Turkish Prime Minister spoke, and I uh, encourage them to continue to do so, uh, but since NATO is a alliance based on consensus, it, it goes without saying that, of course, there's not much NATO can do when uh, allies disagree, because we have to agree 29 to do anything. I think there's another question there. Yes, please. And then in the back. So recently, the United States has ended the long war, the war on terrorism, or at least the Pentagon says so. And in the United States national security strategy in December 2017, and recently the Comptroller for Pentagon outlined in the budget that in the future great power competition will be the greatest security to uh, United States security and by extension NATO as well. So I was wondering will NATO try to revise the nuclear strategy to accommodate great power competition rather than relying on Cold War bipolar strategies? Um. The first national security strategy is a U.S. strategy, but uh, 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 NATO believes that we need a, a strong nuclear deterrent. And, and, of course, we are constantly making sure that we have uh, uh, an effective uh, and, um, and secure uh, uh, nuclear deterrent, uh, meaning that uh, we also, also nuclear weapons um, plays uh, an important role in uh, the deterrence I just described. Uh, we, we have conventional weapons, but we also have uh, nuclear weapons, and we have to make sure that they are yeah, effective and, uh, and safe and secure. Uh, and therefore, we will constantly assess what we have to do to make sure that that's the case also in the future. Um, um, NATO's goal is a world without nuclear weapons, and therefore, we believe in uh, uh, arms control, negotiations, uh, and uh, and uh, I think it's very important to protect those uh, arms control uh, arrangements and agreements that we have in place. I think in the, ba in the back, you're close to the microphone, yes. Um, European Union is also developing defense structures, infrastructures. How do you see that working together with NATO and where does it conflict? I welcome stronger uh, EU efforts on defence, uh, uh, and we have to know that uh, we have to remember that um, the EU and NATO has we have very much in common. Uh, we share much of the same territory in Europe. We share uh, many of the same members, and uh, more than 90 percent, actually 94 percent of. Uh, the population living in the European Union, they live in a NATO country. Uh, so when NATO is strong, uh, also the protection of European uh, or EU members uh, is strong. Um, uh, I welcome stronger EU efforts on defence um, because I think that that can uh, lead to uh, more uh, European defence capabilities, uh, planes, tanks, uh, drones, whatever. Uh, and brigades and divisions and different uh, uh, defense capabilities, which NATO has called for for a long time. And if Europe is going to uh, so they do more to provide that, we should welcome that. Uh, I also think that a stronger European uh, uh, or EU efforts on defense can uh, help uh, EU NATO allies to work more closely together, which is also a good thing. The only thing we have to make sure, and uh, EU leaders have uh, stressed that many times that they will uh, prevent that from happening, is to uh, see the European Union, Union starting to develop competing structures and uh, duplicate what NATO does. Uh, that will weaken our uh, uh, so capabilities and our strengths. And therefore, as long as the European Union complements, not compete with NATO, as long as we don't see uh, EU developing duplicating command structures or uh, structures in general, uh, we should welcome uh, stronger uh, EU efforts on defence. We're going to do something about the gender balance. Uh, please, yeah, pass the microphone. Uh, th firstly, thank you so much for your, uh, for your talk. And uh, perhaps building on uh, the question that was previously asked and also on a point that you made in your speech, uh, which was that 
NATO is a new or is a need for police forces. I was just wondering what is the nature of the relationship between NATO and, for example, Europol and Interpol? Um, it, it may be that as a, it was not my intention to say that NATO should develop police forces. If I said that, that, that was a mistake. Uh, or, uh, uh, because NATO is not, uh, we're not responsible or we, we will not develop police forces. But of course, we work with uh, allies and institutions, for instance, when it comes to exchange of <coughs> intelligence, uh, because we have so many threats uh, which requires partly military response and partly response from police. And I think I refer to the need to have police in the fight against uh, terrorism. But those police forces will not be provided by NATO. They will be provided by uh, NATO allies, uh, but in their national cap ca capacities, or, for instance, by Europol. Uh, so we work with uh, these allies, addressing uh, common threats and, and challenges. Uh, but NATO is, in a way, looking outwards. Uh, uh, national police will then I look uh, uh, inwards at each and every NATO ally. Next, yeah, the microphone is already with you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you very much again. Uh, I was wondering, uh, since he got into presidency, Donald J. Trump has expressed that he's not that much into NATO anymore. Uh, and I was wondering, how is NATO planning on dealing with the possible threat of Trump of leaving the alliance? seeing also that uh, the United States is the main uh, financial contributor to it. Thank you. Um, the NATO is an alliance of 29 democracies, uh, and uh, different political leaders are elected, representing different political parties, coming from different countries with different political cultures, uh, from the right to the left, and, uh, and uh, we are different in many, many ways. Uh, uh, and that's, for me, not a weakness, but actually a strength. Uh, because we have proven that despite the dos those differences, uh, we have always been able to unite against the, or around the core responsibility of NATO, and that is to protect each other. And President Trump has clearly stated that he uh, is committed to NATO. Uh, this has also been supported by his security team, uh, uh, Secretary Mattis, uh, um, and uh, all the other people uh, surrounding him, uh, which gives him uh, advice on uh, defense and security. But even more important than words and commitments and language uh, on uh, uh, support or providing support for NATO is the fact that the United States actually now increases its military presence in Europe. After the Cold War ended, uh, the U.S. Uh, gradually reduced its presence. During the Cold War, the United States had uh, 300,000, more or less, uh, uh, troops in Europe. Uh, then after the Cold War, it would gradually reduce to 60, 70,000. Now the United States and the last U.S. battle tank left uh, Europe uh, in December 2013. Now the U.S. is back with not one battle tank, but with an armored brigade. Uh, they invest uh, heavily in something the U.S. called uh, the European Deterrence Initiative. I think it's five, six billion U.S. dollars for equipment, for training, for supplies, and for more military presence. And this is, t this is happening now. So uh, actions speak louder than words. So not only has Donald Trump uh, expressed his support to NATO, but he has also proven that by uh, more spending, uh, more presence, more exercises, uh, more U.S. military personnel in Europe. Uh, so, um, so uh, and when I met uh, President uh, Trump in the White House last uh, spring, he uh, declared at the press conference that NATO, he used to say, he said, he used to say that NATO is obsolete, but NATO is not longer obsolete, he said. So, uh, uh, so that's a clear message. I'll go for one more in the back. I have tens of questions, so, uh, Secretary General, if you agree, I'll, yeah. we, I'll, I'll, I'll cluster a few. So, first mm. we go to the back there, the lady back, and then we, we come to the center. And I have two, two gentlemen here, and then later we'll see. Please. Um, thank you. I was wondering, um, what's your take on Finland joining NATO? Sorry? Um, oh, uh, yeah. It's working. Um, what do you think of Finland joining NATO Finland. Wait, mm. due to increased uh, tension with Russia? Would Russia take that more as a threat, or...? Yeah. Should, like, just, that would clearly provide security to Finland, but mm. would it be, for NATO, would it be actually 
uh, beneficial or not. Okay, please. Uh, I'd like to ask you about um, 2% budget, budget uh, uh, defense budget policy. And um, what do you see the, how do you see the trend after 2014? And um, uh, what NATO, NATO itself can do against it? Thank you. And final question in this round. You both have a question? Okay, you, you, get, you get the opportunity. First, yourself, and then you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first, I thank you so much for that you came today. You, uh, you mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a beautiful uh, Norwegian language. I see. Yeah. You mentioned, um, with respect to the recent or to the developments in the Arctic, and also you mentioned how uh, NATO has increased its presence in the East. Uh, my question is about. Um, NATO has a relatively small presence in the north, uh, particularly Norway, and now after 20 years there's finally a major uh, operation or um, exercise the Trident Juncture is being held in Norway. And so what do you, what's the significance of this and to what extent do you believe that NATO should increase its presence in Norway and, and, and northern Europe in general? Please send the microphone, then final question in this round. Thank you for giving me the final question, and uh, thank you for your talk as well. Um, my uh, question was originally going to be about EU-NATO uh, cooperation, uh, but now a little bit more specifically, we were told during uh, a visit to the European External Action Service that occasionally uh, intelligence sharing between NATO and the EU does not run as smoothly as it ideally would. Uh, for instance, in the case of Turkey and Cyprus, who are respectively a NATO and an EU member state, but not vice versa, um, their disagreement, political, politically speaking, hinders intelligence sharing on an institutional level. So a lot of uh, different actions have to be taken by experts and ministers just to make sure that um, all member states of the both organizations have all the intelligence uh, that they need. Um, so how would you envision that uh, being solved or working out on the longer term? Because that is obviously not ideal or sustainable. Secretary mm -hmm. General, please. Uh, first on Finland, uh, the main uh, the answer is that that's for Finland to decide whether they want to join uh, NATO or not. And if Finland decided to apply, then of course you would uh, uh, so assess that uh, or, or, or uh, consider that application, and then uh, it will be for 29 uh, NATO allies to decide whether we would uh, uh, so deem or 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 or, or consider uh, um, Finland, as I say qualified to, uh, to, to become a NATO member. I think very much we will, uh, also Finland is a very advanced country, so I think that will not be a big issue. But, but the main issue is whether fin Finland would like to apply. And that's for Finland to decide. Uh, so far, uh, Finland has clearly expressed that they uh, appreciate very much a strong partnership. We work closely with Finland. Finland we have exercises, we, we work with them in different ways, and Finland contributes to NATO missions and operations in Afghanistan and elsewhere, but Finland has clearly stated that they are not interested in applying for a membership. The important message is that Russia or any other third country uh, do not have a say in whether Finland uh, should join or any other country should join uh, NATO, because it is an absolute fundamental principle that each and every sovereign nation has the right to choose its own path. So the whole idea of big countries uh, having some kind of right to decide what small neighbors can do. That's a very dangerous idea. So uh, the idea of a kind of spheres of influence uh, around big countries, denying, for instance, Finland or Norway the right to join uh, NATO is uh, violating uh, fundamental principles uh, when it comes to uh, the sovereignty and the independence of all nations. Um, then um, uh, then uh, the 2% spending. Well, we are moving in the right direction, uh, meaning that when NATO allies, uh, back in 2014, after the illegal annexation of Crimea and, and the rise of Daesh, uh, decided in September 2014 uh, to uh, stop the cuts because, uh, and then uh, we gradually increase and then move towards spending 2% of GDP on defense within a decade, then actually we were only three nations meeting the 2% target. Now we are eight. And also those who are not at the 2% target, they have started to move. All allies have increased defense spending in real terms. So I'm not saying that everything is fine, but I'm saying that after years of decline in defense spending, defense spending has started to increase. 
and that's we have turned the corner and uh, the picture is uh, is uh, still mixed but much better than it was just a couple of years ago and and we didn't promise two percent within the year we promised two percent within the decade and uh, we are really moving in that direction so uh, we have uh, uh, it's a good start what we have seen seen, seen, uh, seen since 2014 then on the Arctic we used to say uh, that uh, in the high in, in the high north we have uh, low tensions and I would like to continue to work for that being the case uh, because uh, uh, yes we have seen increased Russian presence we have seen more naval presence more submarines more exercises but at the same time, I think it's important that we try to keep the tensions low in the high north. Uh, and we also see some cooperation with Russia within the framework of the Arctic Council. But as a Norwegian, you also know that uh, Norway, actually, being a neighbor of Russia, we work with Russia on many different areas. We, when I was prime minister, I remember we, we negotiated with uh, Putin and with Medvedev on a delimitation line in the Barron Sea. We agreed that uh, delimitation line up in the Barron Sea, in the Polar Sea. This is a continental shelf, potentially a lot of oil and gas. We agreed the line. Uh, we worked together with Russia on fisheries, uh, managing a big common cod stock, on environmental issues, border issues, search and rescue, and so on. So I believe that we should continue to engage with Russia up in the high north, uh, it's in our interest and in Russia's interest. But the message is the same, that we have to be uh, firm, we have to be uh, capable of delivering uh, credible deterrence, and therefore NATO also need more, for instance, naval uh, capabilities. Um, and uh, also the new F-35s are critical for the presence of NATO in the high north. NATO is present in the high north uh, because the Norwegian military presence in the high north is NATO in the north. Then, of course, uh, we need more. We have some Danes. Uh, uh, there are yeah, uh, several places in the north. Uh, and uh, I know, you know, uh, so we, we, we like, the Norwegians like uh, Danes. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, uh, but they, um, they, uh, we, were, uh, we were a joint kingdom for some years, and we have some kind of different uh, views on that, how that was. Uh, then, uh, then, uh, and then, of course, we have Canada, the United States, Great Britain, and we have all allies. Uh, but, but not with big military bases, but with the capabilities to deploy forces, to project uh, 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 power, if needed, also up in the high uh, north. Um, uh, uh, then it was this uh, question about intelligence. No, there are some challenges uh, because uh, there are, uh, of course, some NATO. The majority of EU members are also NATO members. And many NATO members, actually the majority of the NATO members are EU members. But not all EU members are NATO members and not all uh, 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 NATO members are EU members. Please write that down. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you understand. <laughs> So the thing is that you have Norway being member of uh, NATO but not being member of EU. You have uh, uh, Austria or Finland, Sweden being member of uh, EU but not member of uh, NATO. And, uh, and, uh, and therefore there are some challenges uh, uh, related to, for instance, uh, uh, um, uh, how to share in, in intelligence. But we have found practical ways of, uh, of sharing information. We have, for instance, a NATO presence in the Aegean Sea uh, helping to implement a agreement between uh, Turkey, a NATO member, and the EU on uh, uh, the migrant and refugee crisis, uh, helping to stop the flow of illegal migration. Um, and there we work together with Frontex, uh, and we have been able to find pragmatic, practical ways of also sharing information. So uh, we haven't solved all the problems, but I think that a pragmatic approach both from the EU and NATO, respecting the the, the, the sovereignty and the decision-making uh, integrity of both of the organizations have enabled, have enabled us to work together. All right, thank you so much. I uh, see in the back and then we'll cluster again. I see many Mr. fingers, but we'll wait and see. Please go ahead. Mr. Secretary General, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, my question concerns Turkey. 
and the changing dynamics in the Middle East. Uh, so we have seen after the low peak of the downing of the Russian jet uh, improvement in the relationship between, between Turkey and uh, Russia in recent times. And uh, in December 2017, there has been the, let's call it, scandal of uh, Russia buying S-400 uh, systems from, uh, of Turkey, sorry, buying S-400 systems for, from Russia. Uh, what's your uh, take on that and NATO's take on that? And how do you see the future development in the relation between Turkey and other NATO allies? Thanks. Second finger I saw there. Yes, please. <clears throat> Yes, thank you for coming. And uh, well, my question pertains to uh, the Scribal case in the United Kingdom and well, the, the use or illegal use by international law of uh, the Russians uh, of chemical weapons on British subjects. And, how, and is that not, does that not trigger Article 5 for NATO? Thank you so much. I see a third question here. Uh, yes, some of my friends think of Russia as this big enemy of the West, and by experiment I visited the country last summer and was surprised to find that uh, a lot of young people there are very nice and similar in thoughts about good government and everything. So my question is how can NATO improve the more informal relationship between Europe and Russia? You pass on the microphone, then we have another question here. So there's been a lot of talk about uh, whether, to what extent, NATO should concern itself with terrorism, with all these new challenges emerging. Um, and I was wondering with how, what your view is on how much international cooperation, coordination is necessary in that field and maybe reflecting on your own experiences in dealing with a terrorism attack against Albert Spatia in IOF, mm. uh, which was very much, much domestic. Mm. Final question in this round here in the front, please. Thank you from my side as well, uh, Secretary General. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us um, more about strategies of NATO against um, Russia's influencing strategies, which are apparently happening all over Europe. So, for example, the use of social bots and adverts on social media or um, the funding of right-wing parties, because these are not necessarily physical military threats, but they could be on another level when they undermine trust and legitimacy of countries. Thank you. Thank you. Secretary General, please. Thank you. First, uh, on uh, Turkey. Turkey is, uh, is an important ally uh, because I think, I, I don't know if I already uh, said that, but Turkey is important for NATO for several reasons, uh, not least because of its geographic location, uh, bordering Iraq and Syria, and it has been a key ally in the fight against Daesh, uh, where we have used uh, Turkish uh, airports, infrastructure bases, uh, to conduct airstrikes uh, and other operations against uh, Daesh. Uh, Turkey is also important because uh, Turkey has suffered uh, many terrorist attacks. No other NATO ally has suffered more terrorist attacks than Turkey. And of course, Turkey has the right to address these legitimate security concerns. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, what we have conveyed is that we expect that to be done in a measured way and in a proportionate way and also in a way which is in accordance with the rule of law. Uh, and that's an issue which has been discussed many times uh, uh, with uh, also the Turkish authorities. Um, uh, then on the S-400, which is an air defense system, uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, that's a national decision. Uh, so the acquirement of, uh, of uh, military capabilities by different NATO allies is not a NATO decision, that's a, a decision by each and every NATO ally. What matters for NATO is whether this system is going to be integrated in, in what we call the integrated NATO air defense, where you know we link the different uh, air defense systems, we link the radar, we share information. That's extremely difficult to uh, do with the S-400. And it has also been clearly stated by Turkey that this is a system which they don't foresee integrated in uh, the NATO integrated air defense system and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, there's been no requests for integration of the Turkish system into the NATO uh, integrated air defense system. On the Skripal case, all NATO allies have strongly uh, uh, expressed support to the United Kingdom. Uh, we have reacted uh, in a coordinated way uh, uh, NATO allies, uh, EU members uh, uh, expelled uh, Russian officials after uh, uh, the uh, use of a nerve agent uh, 
in Salisbury. That's the first time a NERV agent has been used uh, on NATO territory. And uh, I live in Brussels, not far uh, away from Flanders. And in Flanders, uh, 100 years ago, uh, we saw the horrific uh, effects of uh, chemical weapons, where, when chemical weapons were used in the First World War. And a few years after that, we had the first international ban uh, on chemical weapons. And we uh, also have now a, a, a convention on prohibition of chemical weapons. And one of the reasons why we reacted so uh, strongly uh, 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 after the uh, uh, attack or the use of chemical weapon, uh, ke uh, nerve agent in uh, Salisbury, but also after the use of chemical uh, weapons in Syria, where three NATO allies uh, conducted airstrikes against the Syrian um, uh, chemical weapons uh, facilities, uh, was that we have to uphold uh, the ban on chemical weapons and not uh, uh, accept that the use of chemical weapons is uh, normalized or accepted. Uh, and um, and uh, NATO has to respond in the proportionate uh, way and a measured way. And uh, uh, it's serious what happened uh, in Salisbury, but it's not uh, a, an attack or an incident which uh, uh, requires Article 5. Uh, we have to remember that we have invoked Article 5 only once, and that was after a 9-11 attack where thousands of people were killed in, in the United States. We don't trigger Article 5 every time there are serious incidents or that kind of uh, attacks as we, for instance, have seen in uh, Salisbury. Um, uh, uh, but we will continue to provide support to the United Kingdom, and we will continue to, uh, to support the uh, uh, ban on chemical weapons, and that's also the reason why we take so seriously what happened in Syria. Um, then on Russia, I think, I think that first of all, I think it is important to convey that when we criticize Russia for their behavior in Ukraine or their support to the Assad regime uh, uh, or, or uh, their uh, development of nuclear weapons or whatever uh, we uh, criticize them for, uh, it's important to uh, underline that we criticize the, the policies of the uh, Russian government. Uh, we don't criticize the, the people of Russia. Actually, there are, so I know many Russians. Uh, uh, during my life uh, as Norwegian politician, I met uh, Russians in many different uh, capacities, uh, working with them on many different issues, also people-to-people -people contact. Again, referring to Norway, up in Norway we have something called the Barents Corporation, where we have visa-free travel uh, for people living uh, along the borders, on the Russian side and the Norwegian side of the border. Uh, and I believe in contacts. I believe in people-to-people -people contacts. And I believe also in trying to avoid any kind of demonization uh, of other countries. We disagree. We, we, we criticize them. And we are firm, but also measured and defensive. Uh, because Russia is our neighbor, and we have to continue to strive for a better relationship with uh, Russia. Um, then uh, international, yeah, international cooperation, uh, yes, of course, we need international cooperation in the fight against terrorism, uh, and, and, and we need it on all levels. Uh, we need it, of course, when we work together in the coalition to defeat ISIS uh, or Daesh. Uh, we need it in Afghanistan, we need it in Iraq, and we have a lot of international cooperation uh, in NATO, but also in, uh, for instance, the global coalition to defeat ISIS. And we have been quite successful, so we have achieved a lot. We have to remember that not so many months ago, Daesh controlled big parts of uh, Iraq and Syria. Now they have uh, lost almost all the territory they controlled. That hasn't just happened. It has happened before because a lot of NATO allies and other countries have devoted a lot of capacity, military resources, soldiers, planes uh, to uh, defeat uh, uh, Daesh. Uh, but of course, we need also international cooperation in many other areas. I mentioned police. Uh, intelligence and so on, uh, which is uh, partly outside the NATO responsibility. Um, uh, then, was that all? I, uh, huh? Cyber. On, perhaps on, on cyber? Oh, disinformation, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, of course, that's something, that, that's some, something we take very seriously. Uh, because what we see now is that we have what we call hybrid threats. Uh, before, it was very easy to define peace and war. 
Uh, for instance, I think that's the, that's the same for the Netherlands uh, as, as for Norway. It, we had, we, when we speak about the war in Norway, we speak about the Second World War, and we knew exactly when it started, and we knew when it ended, and we knew when it, when it took place. The war in Norway started the 8th and the 9th of April, and then it ended in 1940, and it ended the 8th of May. And then Norway, uh, Denmark, we, uh, Netherlands, we were part of that war. Sweden and Switzerland was not. So it was, it, uh, and it was very clear that this, the, the difference between peace and war. Now the problem is with hybrid threats, is that it, it, it's a much more blurred line between peace and war. It's hard to say. For instance, it's very hard to say when did the war against Daesh start. And it's very hard to say, and to be honest, I, I don't expect that we can have a date where we celebrate that we ended the war with Daesh. And it's actually also hard to say where does it take place. We all know that it takes place in Iraq and Syria, but it also takes place in our own streets, uh, in Asia, in Africa, and in cyberspace. So uh, that's, what sci that's what hybrid threats is all about. This blurred line where there's a mixture of uh, military, non-military use of aggression, disinformation, cyber, uh, covert operations and all that. And uh, therefore NATO uh, has to be able to respond also to, 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 to disinformation. We do that um, and, and propaganda. I believe that the best response to propaganda is not propaganda. The best response to propaganda is the truth. Uh, and the truth will prevail. Of course, NATO and NATO allies, we can provide facts. We can counter when we see that there is disinformation being also presented. Uh, and we do that. We have teams, we have people who, who share uh, the truth and the facts when we see that this disinformation uh, is, is, is presented in different ways. But perhaps the best tool against disinformation is a free and independent press. Is to have journalists, media, newspapers, TV channels, which ask the difficult questions, uh, which are able to, who are able to check the, the sources, and to and to ask all the difficult questions to make sure that we have uh, the truth and not propaganda uh, uh, presented to us. Secretary General. Uh, thank you so much on behalf of all of us, uh, not, not only for your speech, but also for the open and frank way you have answered uh, all the questions, almost all the questions, because there were many more uh, from, our, uh, from, from our students. Thank you so much for it. We wish you all the very best uh, in your, uh, all your activities in NATO, more specifically, as I said, preparing a very important summit uh, in the second week of, uh, of, of July. So, you know, I'm going to give you a, a, a small token of our appreciation, uh, remembering uh, cufflinks of Leiden University, remembering that when President George W. Bush gave me cufflinks, he said, Secretary General, here are cufflinks, but I don't want to see them on eBay in a few days. <laughs> uh, I know you're not the person to do that, uh, ni neither am I, but as a token uh, of our appreciation, cufflinks of Leiden University, uh, and thank you ever so much for having come. Thank you. Thank you.